so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman. You're listening to the No Filter podcast. And this story starts with a we, which is not something I've ever said about an episode of No Filter before. But hey, I like to keep things interesting around here. The name Ashley Madison will probably be familiar to you. Either back from 2002, when the dating site for people who wanted to have an affair launched, or the recent Netflix documentary about it. Ashley Madison was a business and a website that was set up specifically for married people who wanted to have an affair with other married people. It kind of operated on this idea of mutually assured destruction. It was pretty scandalous at the time. Their tagline was, life is short, have an affair. And the CEO, a bloke called Noel Biederman, capitalised on all that controversy. He was this kind of over-the-top showman who would go on TV and do all these interviews and he'd often drag his wife along as well, basically making the argument that cheaters are going to cheat, why not monetize it? And monetize it, he did. Ashley Madison made tens of millions of dollars. That was until 2015 when an anonymous group who called itself the Impact Team announced that it had hacked the Ashley Madison website. After some frantic attempts by Noel and the Ashley Madison management to stop the impact team, they made good on their promise and released the data. Not only did this mean that the names of all the would-be cheaters were released, but also their home addresses, their bank details, and even things like their sexual preferences. All of this stuff had to be entered when you joined the website. And the leak also exposed the fact that the site was mostly full of men and that the women, well, they were bots, as in they were not real. I remember when this happened, it was massive news and journalists were scouring the list for anything that was explosive, particularly people who were in the public eye, men that were in the public eye. People's lives were ruined. People lost their jobs, their reputations were destroyed, and some people even took their own lives because of the consequences and the humiliation. And caught up in this firestorm was one couple called Sam and Nia Raider. They were childhood sweethearts, and you may have seen them if you've watched the Netflix documentary. I loved being a dad. I loved my wife. It was a beautiful marriage, but it was also just, like, monotonous. I remember seeing an advertisement, Life is Short, Having an Affair. I was like, that sounds intriguing. Before the Ashley Madison scandal broke, Sam and Nia were pretty successful family vloggers, kind of like influencers before that was a thing, and they made viral videos about their lives together with their young family. One video that shows a very happy Sam and Nia driving with their daughter in the back seat while they lip-synced to a Frozen song really put them on the map when it went viral, and it even caught the attention of Disney. For Sam, it turns out that love was, in fact, an open door, but maybe not in the way Nia thought. The next video that they made that went viral, this is where the we comes in. So Sam wanted to do something really big and splashy and to get a lot of attention on YouTube, and Nia had told him that her period was late. So what he did, he filmed all this, was to go into the bathroom after she'd been to the toilet and get a pregnancy test and extract some of her wee from the toilet, put it on the pregnancy test and tell her live while he was filming and get her reaction. So here I am and I'm so excited. I have a specimen. I have a specimen. I knew it would be there. I don't know if it'll throw it off because it's all diluted, but um, I also brought home a pregnancy test. And this time around, I'm going to be doing the announcement. At least I hope, I hope so bad she's pregnant. The angle on it was that he was going to know that she was pregnant before she knew that she was pregnant. And yes, it went viral and they did lots of interviews about it. I told you the story was unusual. So that's the way. Sam and Nia share a lot about their experience in the documentary and even more in their book 
called Live in Truth. But in the course of the conversation I'm about to share with you, they open up about a lot of very personal details that they haven't shared before, even in the Netflix documentary. I know that the biggest question you'll have, the biggest question most people have when they hear Sam and Nia's story, is how do you get past cheating? How do you get past betrayal and public humiliation? How do you get past the person who's meant to love you more than anyone betraying you like that? Sam and Nia are disarmingly honest. And as you'll hear, their story is actually a lot more than just the Ashley Madison scandal. It's about love and infidelity and betrayal and forgiveness and how all of those things can take many forms. Here's my conversation with Sam and Nia. The first time I became aware of you guys, I was running a women's website, part of our company still today, and it was the Wee video. I'm going to say it. Sam, how did the idea of the pregnancy test come about? It was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. What gave you that idea? How much of it was about making good content and how much of it about you just thought it would be a really cool thing to do? It's funny because I was an ER nurse at the time, so it was kind of just normal for me to find out when other women are pregnant before they did. That was kind of normal. And so we had the YouTube channel. I was still working as a nurse and I'm testing this lady's year now and I'm trying to figure out how we can make our next pregnancy a big moment like everybody else in the blogging space was. Like the pregnancy videos were huge. <laughs> so it's like, how can I do something nobody else has done? And yeah, it clicked. It's like, I got to do this to me. I collect her year and then get the <laughs> positive pregnancy result before she does. That was so wild. Nia, I mean, I assume you discussed it before you posted it. How did you feel about that? I was so excited to be pregnant. I didn't even care. Like it didn't even cross my mind much that my pee was going to be. I never, <laughs> and I also never, like Sam has such grand ideas. He He's always able to like see them all the way through. I'm never thinking in my head, like this is going to go viral. Millions of people are going to see my pee. Like that just wasn't <laughs> what was going through my mind. And you know, once it happened, of course, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I explained like, because <laughs> yeah. people are like, you're dehydrated. What? That's so gross. You know, like I'm here, you know, like, <laughs> all the things. There's a very logical reason. I've had some moms back me up on it. We lived in an older home with I guess is thin walls the wrong way to put it. You could just hear everything. You could hear the walking around on the ground anyway. And so I didn't flush the toilet at night because it would wake the babies up. Or so I thought if I had flushed the toilet and then a kid woke up, that happened multiple times. We had two children at the time that happened multiple times with my babies. And so I just was like, I'm not even going to risk it. You know, I'm just want to know all these people who are so annoyed by it. Like, do you actually flush? I think a lot of people do understand though. Nia, I back you fully. Who flushes the toilet even in the middle of the night after number ones? Like, why would you? 19 million people saw that video and celebrated with you guys. Afterwards, though, you had a miscarriage, which was devastating, and I'm so sorry for your loss. And that's when you saw the ugly side, isn't it? Because some people said you just did the whole thing for a publicity stunt. You know, what was the reaction? Well, they first originally accused us of faking the pregnancy, saying we can't get a positive result. We can't get HCG hormone in diluted urine, which was false. You can. But we had people mm. testing it, accusing us of lying, and then the miscarriage happened. So people doubled down like, yep, they were absolutely faking it. Now they're faking a miscarriage. It was so devastating. It, just like I had no expectations of that first video going viral. Like I just was blindsided by the hate. Honestly, I feel like in the other times that we've experienced, you know, hate comments and stuff like that. It just, I don't know. This one really blindsided me because I was already grieving. It was so, so hard. I could, I, it still blows my mind. People truly believe I faked a miscarriage. It's crazy to me. You guys were a brand by this point. Your family was a brand. You know, you were going through something really tough and you also had to contend with everybody else having their feelings about it, which in this case was so cruel. Did it give you pause and make you think, you know what, I don't want to expose myself our marriage, our family to this? I never did. I always felt like I had nothing to hide, even though I was hiding something, <laughs> but yeah. which is weird. I just don't mind sharing private moments with people. I, I think that started probably pretty early on. Your marriage was, by all accounts, looked great. You had a young family. You seemed happy. You were this gorgeous, good-looking couple. You still are pretty good-looking, let's be honest, 10 years later. And I think that's really important to look at that because – a lot of people think that cheating only happens in bad marriages when, you know, people are really disconnected, maybe when they're not having sex anymore, when they fall out of love. 
But it didn't seem from the videos that that was the case with your marriage. Now, Nia, of course, you didn't know what was going on, but Sam, can you just take me a little bit inside your head at that time and why you started looking outside your marriage and what you were looking for? I think a lot of people believe I was straying and doing things behind Nia's back while we were vlogging and it never happened while vlogging. So when you say you saw a happy marriage and everybody looked happy, I was keeping secrets, but I wasn't doing anything behind Nia's back from what people were seeing on the internet. But six months, four months previous to starting YouTube, that was probably the last time, or that was the last time I deleted Ashley Madison. That was the last time I strayed and we found a church. So yeah, what was going through my head? The first one, gosh, let me think. How long had you been married the first time? It was in our first year. Mm -hmm. How long, how many months in? I, she knows these details better yeah. than I do. I mean, had to have just been a few months in, like, I got pregnant. We had like a honeymoon pregnancy. And I think what is middle towards the end of my pregnancy. I was in nursing school at the time, surrounded by women. And I made friends with a couple of guys who were single and they flirted with all the women. They went out with them. I kind of came along. I feel like that was kind of the start. I started becoming like my friends. But then, of course, they left the scene and I continued to make stupid choices. I think it was just trying to find excitement in my life. When I became a nurse, I hated the job. I was like, what the heck did I do? I spent six mm. years for this job and I hate it. And life just kind of hit me hard. And I think I did a lot of this stuff, almost like self-mutilation. It was like, I hate myself. So let's just do this to yourself. Do whatever you want. You know God doesn't want you to do this, but just do it anyway. It's not that Nia wasn't fulfilling me in my marriage. That wasn't the reason. Like if you want to really get down to like the basic answer, I think – I hate saying the word, but boredom, maybe. Were you looking for attention? I don't mean to sound cruel when I say that, but in your book, I learned that you were in a rock band in high school. It was called Free the Float. And the first song that you wrote and recorded was All We Want Is Fame. Yeah. <laughs> you described yourself as a 17-year-old as being an attention-hungry class clown. When you were this 28-year-old nurse, was that how you were feeling again? that you wanted some attention? Yeah, from since I could remember, I was like always imagining myself in front of a large audience and being applauded. And I would watch my favorite mm -hmm. bands, but it wasn't their music I loved the most. It was their adoration that they were receiving that I loved the most. And <laughs> it was a really strange thing. I, I assume it was from the lack of validation I got from my father. Now, as I look back, I kind of realized some of that. But um, yeah, in nursing school, I also was the class clown. I got class clown at the end of the thing. So yeah, I was still constantly looking for attention, cracking up during class. And I was even sent to the office as an adult in nursing school. Which is oh my God. <laughs> you got sent to the principal as an adult? I know, it's so pathetic. And I still fight it today. It's a, just an ongoing thing. When you started to cross some lines, was it a very clear line or was it things got a little bit blurry? in the way that you were behaving with other women? Like, is there a particular moment where you crossed over a particular line that you can remember? Yeah, I was always just walking right on the line. You know, it was like signing up for Ashley Madison and like literally saying, I want to have an affair. Like when I got to that point, it's like, what the heck, how did I get here? Like several years ago, I would have never just blatantly chosen to have an affair. It faded into that, you know, it was, it was a slow fade. Mm -hmm. and of course it started probably with pornography. And, you know, like in the documentary movies, I was so fascinated by romance and that aspect of my, my marriage that a novelty wore off. And that was a bummer for me. So I wanted to keep seeking that, that attention and that romance. That's probably where it started, just making eyes with other people, women making eyes back at me, just that, that type of romance that you don't know touching or anything, but you just know there's a thing between you two. That's probably how it started. And then I kept going. It's so interesting listening to Sam and Nia now after they've shared so much of their lives with the world on Netflix and with their own audience and community on their YouTube channel because it's so clear that it's still a very difficult conversation to have. I thought they might be like kind of blasé about it, but what you can't see because you're listening to this is that Sam and Nia are actually talking to me from their bedroom while we're doing this interview. Behind them, I can see their bed. And on the wall behind their bed is a big blown up photograph of their family. It is just so intimate. And I can hear their kids playing in the background. They're not in the room, of course, but I can hear them in another part of the house. And what Sam is about to disclose next 
really does feel like a private conversation between a husband and a wife in the safety of their bedroom, sharing things that they did not share on the Netflix documentary. I didn't mean to get an exclusive, but here we are. How far did you go? Well, we were agreeing not to talk about details, but I had intercourse one time. Physically, that was how far I went. Intercourse one time with the prostitute. Emotionally, how far I went, I kissed a girl, held her hands. I guess that would be kind of just tell you how emotionally. It's kind of surreal. We're sitting here. You guys are in your bedroom. You're talking to a stranger across the other side of the world in Australia. We can hear a storm in the background, which is kind of symbolic. Your husband's sitting next to you talking about that time he had sex. How do you feel? It's so weird because I can I can hear these things as facts and details that like matter for us to get to where we are today. Uh, of course, mm. I mean, it, it's sad. It's sad that he got there. It's sad that our, our marriage went through what it went through. But I don't see what he's saying as him. When he says these things, I'm envisioning mm. a version of him. And, you know, that's a beautiful thing that I can sit next to this version of Sam and that guy is long gone. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for that. It's, it still hurts her a little bit. <laughs> I know it's just facts, but yeah. every time we bring this stuff up, it's it's painful for both of us. And I got to be extra close to her after this and just mm-hmm. kind of remind her who I am. In the book, Sam, you write, infidelity doesn't add spice, it invites chaos. Even before the data breach with Ashley Madison, what kind of chaos was it inviting into your life? Well, first, just covering up the lies. I think the chaos started within myself. I was supposed to have a relationship with the Lord. And I was praying to him, yet I was still doing these things. And then I got further from the Lord. That was the first chaos. There's no order within me. Like I stopped following Mm. the manual that is the Bible. And so I was just scattered. My emotions were scattered. And then bringing that into my marriage, I thought I could handle that outside of my marriage. But it turns out Nia, Nia had suspicions for good reasons because, you know, my personality started changing. Like my love for her started decreasing because I was distracted by thoughts of other women. So that chaos entered the home. Then I was distracted, you know, getting down on floor with my kids was difficult because I was so sidetracked by my sneaking life. You know, that's the chaos. It's like people think, let me take a breath here. You're doing really good. It's not easy to talk about this stuff. I think a lot of people want freedom. They're like, I want freedom for my marriage. So I'm going to go outside of my marriage and seek freedom. But what I found is I became enslaved rather than more free. And I've started to understand that freedom is actually just obeying the laws of the Lord and the laws of nature, obeying those and staying within its confines. I explained this in documentary that didn't make it, but I kind of look at it as like being in the swimming pool. Like if you don't obey the laws of of the water, you'll drown. But if you do obey the rules and you swim and you respect its resistance against you, it's very freeing. If you can Mm. respect its boundaries. And so that's what I've learned. And I look back and I see that I was very much enslaved. Yeah, tangled up in this web of lies. Nia, it's interesting he mentioned that you were suspicious. Looking back at that time, were you suspicious? Did you think maybe there was someone else or that he was fooling around? Yes, multiple times. A few times like spot on. I would specifically say, "I, I think maybe you did this or I think maybe you are getting too close to this person. I mean, Mm. spot on (laughs) and he would convince me that I was wrong or that I was you know behind my imagination and of course like we still had a a good relationship for the most part you know and it was easy to believe it if he's you know convincing me and stuff it was easy to convince myself because I would list out the things that were going well and kind of and say okay he couldn't be doing that because xyz what were xyz out of interest What were the things that were going well that made you think, oh, well, he couldn't be having an affair because these things? Well, like for starters, going to church with me and our daughter, sleeping with me, being intimate with me, kissing me, not just like randomly either. I mean, we had like one specific time that he had betrayed me the evening he had he'd come home and and we had like a really sweet moment. I sat in his lap. We looked at some stuff together. We cuddled. And he had just been out with another woman. Like it's, it's strange and I don't understand it. But in the moment when he confessed everything to me, I thought everything was a lie. Nothing had ever been real. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I can look at those and see how conflicted and just like torn he, I mean, I would have felt really torn and conflicted just looking back at the pattern that we had. Like those are some of the things we still had closeness and fun. 
I'm remembering like during that time, Nia was suspicious and I was able to still love on her and accept her love. I feel like it was probably just like she was kind of my comfort. Like there was chaos in those affairs outside of my marriage. Like there was complications, you know, and, you know, stupid things that they were doing or they decided not to talk to me anymore or whatever that was kind of hurting me or whatever. I hate to say mm. it like that. I hate talking about stuff out loud. But Nia was my comfort during that chaos outside of my marriage. Nia, Sam found out that his name was in the Ashley Madison leak while the two of you were in Seattle for a really important conference for your vlogging career. You just sat down for lunch and Sam dropped the bomb. What do you remember of that moment? I know this is like a comical aspect of it, but I, I was so hungry. I had not eaten all day long and I was like <laughs> hangry. Were you pregnant? I wasn't, but I had just, I just, it was, no, I, I had just miscarried. You also just had dental work. Yeah, I'd had dental work done. I hadn't eaten Ugh. anything all day long. And I just, I was just hungry. <laughs> like, you know, I just, we had no kids. Rarely did I eat a meal without children. I was looking forward to just like having a good meal <laughs> with my husband. So there's that aspect of it. And I like really remember just like that. And then just sitting down and Im- almost immediately, he's just so intensely telling me this shocking news and embarrassing mm. news. It wasn't just the shock of like, I did this or I tried to have an affair. It wasn't just that. It was like layered with embarrassment because of how public it was. And then also the minimizing that happened in the moment of like angry, crushed, but let's try to like, let me think, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. It was just a lot in one moment. Did you think about going home? Like you had to go and turn up at this conference. It was all over the internet. You had to be in front of people. I did. I wanted her to, I wanted her to go back home with me, but she wouldn't. Yeah. I didn't want to go home. I mean, like this was a, like a getaway. We were getting away without the children for a weekend. And this was an opportunity like for our YouTube career. This is like a huge deal to me. And this was something like we were invited to be a part of this crew of creators that had been around for a while and in the space way longer than we had been like, you know, in a way it's like, we don't really belong, but here we are, you know, no, I wanted to go. And I thought, to some degree, I wanted him to face everybody. I like, I was embarrassed and mad. And I thought, no, you have to go face this together. Sam, that apology video that you did soon after that everyone was, you know, screaming at you to make and kind of you needed to make some kind of comment. You looked terrified in that video. <laughs> did I? <Wow. laughs> yeah. What was going through your mind? I was just in self-preservation mode. It was like, it's time to survive. And... Gosh, I did whatever it took. I was extremely anxious, sweaty palms, <laughs> extremely like snappy at Nia. It's like, we got to get this done. We had to do several takes. I was feeling pressure from my audience, from our, my family, even family I haven't heard from was like, hurry up and get a statement out there. People want to know about this. So I was like, okay, I'll just tell them what they probably want to hear. And of course, what I wanted them to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that the name that you chose on Ashley Madison, which was Dirty Little Secret Man, there's a lot of self-loathing in that in that name, isn't there? <laughs> self-loathing, that's hilarious. Dirty yeah. Little secret yeah, just man. dirty, little. Yeah, it feels like you were not very proud of who you were even at the time. You knew that you were doing the wrong thing. That's interesting. I mean, it's a great point. I actually never even thought about that. But, yeah, I was in a place where, like, I knew – I was doing. You're right. Nia, there's two types of reactions after you hear that someone's been unfaithful. One is to not want to talk about it. And the other is to want every single detail in a bid to try and process it. Which were you? Every single detail. I wanted all of the information down to what socks he wore. Like I wanted to know every single thing I could possibly get my hands on. And that was extremely, <laughs> extremely painful and exhausting. Sorry, I'm not trying to point at me, but <laughs> for both of us, it was just like it's such a painful process because it just like just kept revisiting it over and over for months, and it was just yeah, really it was a hard. lot of a lot of questions. Nia, what a roller coaster for you. It almost made me think when I was here reading the book of labor, you know, like when you have contractions and it's like there's another one coming and another one coming and another one coming. And each time it crushes you, like each time you heard a new detail from Sam, you started that cycle of anger, I imagine, and and betrayal again. How long did it go on for? And what were the worst things that he told you in terms of the things that hurt the most? You don't have to be specific about, but like the types of things. 
he really thought the physical things that he did were going to be the most painful. And he said it even, I'm going to start with the worst and I'll, I'll work my way down the list. But really the most painful ones were actually the things he considered the lowest things on the list. The very last couple of things he confessed to me were just emotional things that didn't really go anywhere. You know, one was just him pursuing someone that didn't even reciprocate. Those hurt the worst. That was your friend, right? Yes. I don't know if it was the friend aspect. Of course, that's a, that plays a part in it. But I, I don't know if maybe the emotional part too. Like I, that was really, really mm. hard for me. I think I could kind of wrap my head around like sexual fantasies and stuff. But our love was so strong. And, you know, if he had a pornography addiction or sexual fantasies, I, I felt like I could logically get my head wrapped around that. But it was when his heart got brought into it where I really couldn't. I really struggled with that, like trying to make sense of it. Why? How? How did you yeah. get there? So yeah, I would say maybe two months before the end of all the past confessions were out because he would just remember them. Like he just said, he would just, mm. a memory would come to him and, and he would just tell me, you know, sometimes out of nowhere and sometimes he would say, hey, I have something to tell you. Were you still living together through all of this? Did you move out, Sam? Did you move out, Nia? Like how close did you get to divorce? Yeah, I was kicked out of the house. Yeah. I mean, and I, respectfully left. Obviously, I didn't exactly <laughs> get kicked out, but respectfully mm. left because you didn't want me around. I stayed at my pastor's house for a week. Yeah. And then once I got back in the house, I stayed in a different bedroom. Did you think about divorce, Nia? Oh, yeah. In the, be- the early days, I was convinced like we were getting a divorce. There was no other way around it. What about you, Sam? Divorce? Yeah. Did you think it was on the cards? Did you want it? Did you want to be free to go and pursue these other relationships? No, on my end, I never, ever felt like I had a right to consider divorce. But yeah, I I was definitely nervous that Nia would choose to leave me. Was there a moment where you went, you know what, I can actually see a future for us. I think we can get through this. Yes, I had a very clear moment. Actually, before he ever confessed anything to me, I just knew that the Lord had told me, we would be in marriage ministry one day. And I I came home and told him and looking back now, his reaction to me telling him that was kind of like telling. What's marriage ministry? Talking with and helping and sitting across from other couples, like just being in the marriage space within our church, within a church community, and just being available to support other couples. And we had not gone through anything hard at that time when I, when I had that moment. So fast forward to, he's confessed everything to me. And I told him, I want to divorce him. I was sitting in the car again, praying, just literally praying. Could you just tell me yes or no? Like spell it out. I was very like a child praying. And I had that memory of before he ever confessed anything to me where we were reaching other couples and supporting other couples. But that was the moment where I said, okay, I'm going to stay and I'm going to fight. And I, I didn't feel it yet. You know, I didn't feel like we're going to be happy. I even thought I might be unhappily married to him for a long time, I'm going to work towards forgiveness. How do you build trust back? That took a long time, but it started with the confessions and being as open to her as possible. So she saw that and nothing to hide and anything she asked, answering those questions, honestly. And when she saw like me answering those questions that were bringing myself pain, basically torturing myself by expressing so much about myself, that's what, that's where it starts. And then after that, letting her call the shots, basically, of my life, letting her kind of just tell me what she's comfortable and what she's not comfortable with and just allowing and not fighting it, even if I don't understand it. She doesn't want me doing this. She doesn't want me talking to this guy anymore, but I'd actually never done anything with, with that guy. But she still doesn't want me talking to him. So I was like, okay, I can't, can't talk to you anymore. <laughs> Things like that and setting big boundaries and sticking to them. For example, not talking to women alone, texting women, staying out at night, going out with certain people, or actually only going out with solid Christian men. Just really strict boundaries and think all that. If you've ever been cheated on or had a big betrayal in your relationship and forgiveness or staying together wasn't an option, it might be confronting to hear that Nia chose to forgive Sam after so much emotional and physical unfaithfulness. A lot of people got really angry, interestingly not just at him but at her. 
And maybe you're someone who has religion in your life and you draw from that well for your value system like they do. Or maybe you aren't a religious person and some of Sam and Nia's ways of making sense of what they've been through aren't as relatable to you. But there's a whole layer to Sam and Nia's backstory that you're about to hear that for me really explained a lot about why they both fought so hard for their marriage and their family and also how they approached the fact that Sam had betrayed Nia. What I found really interesting to learn, Nia, you've got an incredible story, which could be an episode all unto itself, but the fact that you tragically lost your mother when you were just three, she was involved in drugs, she sounded like she was an amazing person, she followed bands around, your your biological father was in a band or a rock star or something. Did you ever find out who he was? Did you ever meet him? I've never met him, but yes, I'm aware of who he is. (laughs) And you were raised by your grandparents from the age of three who you came to call mum and dad and their marriage broke up due to infidelity when you were a kid. And Sam, you had not a dissimilar experience. Your father left your mum for another woman when you and your brothers were quite young as well. How did that shape both of your view of marriage? Because you got together quite young, you were only 15. How did that shape your view of marriage and what you were looking for in in a partner? just gave me a really clear vision of what I wanted and what I didn't want really early on. I I mean, I didn't want someone who, who drank or, you know, partied or lived the kind of lifestyle that I saw within the marriages that I saw break apart as a young child. And also like informed me of like what I did want, which was a Christian man who had strong morals, was kind, showed me what I wanted and what I didn't want. And I stuck really hard to it. I think, (laughs) I mean, I was so young, but you know, Sam, what about you? It must have hurt you terribly seeing how your mom suffered after your dad cheated and then left. Did that make you think about marriage when you got older? Yeah, at the time, I, I feel like I probably mostly didn't, wasn't very observant of it. I don't have much recollection of too much of it. Probably blocked a lot of it out. I never saw like an intimate relationship between my mom and dad. But for some reason, the fights kind of stick out. My dad's temper stands out. He was a good man, but for some reason, those stand out. He was a good man until he left. <laughs> he was talking to another woman. I basically saw him do it. He took me to the woman's house. We get back home. My mom asked me what we did on the way home. And I confessed to her what had happened because I felt guilty myself just being a part of it. Yeah, that was an extraordinary betrayal, him taking you kids to that woman's home. You got together really young, you two. You're only 15. What was that like? Was it tempting? Were you both still very much of your faith? We both had really strong morals. And that's one thing that like drew us together. We used to do little Bible studies together. We prayed together. We we worked hard to be pure before marriage. I say we worked hard, but it was a big, yeah. it was a big topic for us that we tried to like overcome it, you know, but it was also like, I don't know, for me, it was also like fireworks and rainbows and butterflies. Like it was so magical and like a movie kind of love in, in the beginning. I mean, I don't know, mm-hmm. all the way through. That part never went away. Sam, did you imagine that you would marry the first woman that you were intimate with? Was that the plan? Was that important to you? So all my friends, they were they were out partying, having sex with multiple women, trying to get me and looking at pornography. They basically introduced me to pornography. But yeah, I was adamant about saving my virginity for marriage. And then I met Nia and she had all the same morals as myself. And like she said, I saw what I didn't want when I got older and and my mom and dad. I didn't want that for my family. We know so much more about childhood trauma and cycles of behaviour in families that get passed down through generations. And we also know that everyone reacts differently to trauma, to betrayal. For Nia, she remained really steadfast in her determination to break that cycle of infidelity and family upheaval that she'd experienced. But Sam, like so many people do, found himself repeating it. So much so that when he was at the kind of lowest low of his cheating, he shared his secret with his dad in the same way that his dad had with him when he was just a child. And I actually, I didn't never mention this in the book and I feel like I want to somehow. I kind of introduced him to one of them, one of the women I was having an affair with when we were married as an adult. And I kind of felt like, oh, yeah, 
right on cue. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. You guys have got a very direct line to God, it feels. That's <laughs> <laughs> It does feel like I didn't realize he was going to join in on this interview. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> With some punctuation. And I felt yeah. like my dad was going to be proud. I remember that feeling. Like I thought he would be proud. Oh, wow. It was such a stupid thing, such an immature thought as an adult mm-hmm. to have that my dad would be like, oh, cool, you you got women outside your marriage. What did he say to you? He didn't say much, but he wrote Nia an email. Mm-hmm. And this is all new information. We've never, ever talked about this. Yeah. This is all kind it's of It's hard to back. talk about because he's not with us anymore. I don't know. But yeah, he but did. But he, he, he was looking out for me. He knew. He, did. He, he was. And it didn't go very well because I didn't receive the information very well. Do you mean that he wrote you an email, Nia, telling you what Sam was doing? Well, maybe just saying, I think Sam could be getting curious yeah. about some things. He suggested it, it was, to Yeah, her. it was like, it wasn't like he told, you know, yeah. or anything like that. Sam, it's interesting that he introduced you to his the woman he was having an affair with, and then you went and repeated that pattern all those years later. I mean, like my oldest brother, we talk about this quite a bit. My dad basically, he modeled for us that that boundary can be crossed. Like the yeah. number one man I looked up to crossed that boundary. And I'm looking up at him saying, oh, okay, that boundary you can cross. And not only that, he showed me what it was worth. It was worth six children and a wife he had been married to for so long is worth his home. I think that really does damage to a boy and it teaches him something. It gives him a really hard lesson that there's a lot to be had in an affair. Wow. That's so interesting what you say, because I would have thought that you would have gone, I'll never do that because I saw what it cost. But what you saw was that it was so worth it because he walked away from his, all his children and his house and his marriage. So it must be pretty awesome to have an affair and do that. Wow. That's all subconsciously, though. Yeah, I did not want to repeat what he did. Thank you so much for sharing that. (sighs) Just so you know, this isn't the end of my conversation with Sam and Nia. We stayed a little longer in their bedroom. What they shared about their childhoods really put things in a different perspective for me because knowing that both Sam and Nia came from families that had been torn apart by infidelity, you can see that their story began long before Ashley Madison And that it's ongoing. I mean, even now, they're navigating this together and they're navigating all of it while the Ashley Madison Netflix documentary is getting global attention. I mean, that's how I reached out to them because I saw them on Netflix. So in part two of this interview, why did they choose to participate in the documentary? Do they regret it? And what's happened since then? How are they talking to their kids about all of this now that it's out in the open? Sam and Nia have four kids and their oldest is 14 Her name's Symphony, so we know that that means she's hearing about things and so are some of their other kids. Here's a little bit about what we talked about in this next part of the conversation. Red flags, run girl, once a cheater, always a cheater. I mean, you name it. I think every single thing has been written in a comment thread about how I should, I'm so dumb or he's so bad or we're so fake. What kind of fallout has there been from the documentary? And does Sam ever get tired of apologising? It's kind of like this global punishment tour where he just has to go and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Does Nia have a red line now that would make her rethink staying with someone who's cheated? Does she think everybody should stay with a cheating partner? And if you're like me and your girlfriends are your lifeline, one thing in the documentary that really hit hard was when Nia found out that Sam had propositioned one of her closest friends and that friend had just cut off ties with both of them and Nia hadn't known why. I wanted to know how that part of the story ended as well. Just click the link in the show notes to listen. I'm also popping a link to Sam and Nia's book, Live in Truth, in the show notes. This episode was produced by Kimberly Bradish and Naima Brown with sound production by Leah Porges. I'm Mia Friedman. I'll see you in part two.